Welcome to the Barnes & Noble at Boston University, and thank you all for coming out tonight. We are honored to have the award-winning author and poet Ha Jin with us this evening to read from and discuss his latest novel, A Free Life, which was released today. With a debut marked as a profound book, an event by renowned poet Frank Bedar, Ha Jin has become one of our most noteworthy writers with his lyrical poetry and hauntingly beautiful novels. Once quoted as saying, I think the ultimate goal for a piece of literature is to transcend time to some degree, not to vacate it, but to go through it. Ha Jin is a remarkable author whose works do more than just transcend time, but all kinds of barriers, cultural, political, personal, to create a lasting and indelible experience of humanity. In a free life, Jin turns his pen to the immigrant, ex excuse me, immigrant experience in America. A tale of isolation and sacrifice, it is the story of the Wu family, who after the Tiananmen Square massacre, sever all ties with their homeland and begin a new life in America. As the Wu's strive to realize their dreams in the midst of disillusionment, Jin's evocative and profound gifts of graceful prose and keen characterization illuminate the contemporary immigrant struggle. A departure from his previous works, A Free Life is the first to be set in America, but is in no way a departure from his elegant style and uncommon insight. As the New Yorker explains, reading Ha Jin is almost like falling in love. You experience anxiety, profound self-consciousness, and an uncomfortable sensitivity to the world, and somehow it's a pleasure. And Bookless praises a free life, saying, Capacious, pointillistic, empathetic, and tender, Hajin's tale of one immigrant family's odyssey in America affirms humankind's essential mission, to honor life. Born in a small town in China, Hajin became a member of the People's Liberation Army during China's Cultural Revolution. After leaving the Army, he studied English in college before traveling to the United States to do graduate work at Brandeis. In 1989, while studying at Brandeis, he watched the Tiananmen Square Massacre and decided to immigrate. In 1993, he received his Ph.D. in English from Brandeis. His first teaching position was at Emory University, and his first publication, a book of poetry entitled Between Silences, was released in 1990. Since then, he has joined the creative writing program here at Boston University and published numerous works, including the 1999 National Book Award award-winning and winner of the 2000 Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction, Waiting, his first full-length novel. His next novels were The Crazed and War Trash, which was a winner of the 2004 Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction. He is also a recipient of the Penn Hemingway Award and the Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction. Ladies and gentlemen, Ha Jin. Thank you, thank you for being here. Can people in the back hear me? Okay, good, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to, basically, I'm going to talk about this book, and uh, maybe I would read some, uh, maybe a po some poems, because we, we do, there is a, a chapbook of poems attached to it, and uh, I will leave plenty of time for conversation. I hope you, uh, you will have questions so that, <laughs> Not just myself <laughs> talking. And, okay, and <coughs> uh, in fact, the book was. If the idea for this book struck me uh, a long time ago, fifteen years ago, uh, while I was still a graduate student at BU. <laughs> at the time, the, uh, my friend Jennifer Rose, uh, who was the uh, managing editor at the Agony Review. And uh, in the winter of 1992, uh, one day she showed me a book, a book of poems written in Chinese. And she couldn't read the poems, and she, that's why she showed it to me. And, and the book was given to her by a, a restaurant owner, a restaurant owner in Waltham, a, a recent immigrant from Hong Kong. And the guy was, there were pictures in the book and <coughs> showing that he, he, at what stage he tried to, be, he had been writing uh, uh, at different stage, what kind of poem, what poems were published in the book. And so it showed a long process of struggle. And I was very touched by the book uh, because uh, on the one hand, on, on the one hand he, he he had to struggle to survive as a, as a 
recent involvement. On the other hand, he really tr he tried very hard to be uh, to be a poet. In fact, the book was self-published. It was uh, uh, by a Vanity Press. And that gave me an idea. I, I thought this would be a good idea for a novel eventually. But at the same time, uh, I, I knew that I could not write a book like this because I didn't understand the, the, the pr experience yet. So I would have to wait. And that's why I, I didn't start. I just began to, to keep files, uh, notes, files uh, for this, uh, for this book, and then in 1999, I uh, I received a, a Guggenheim Fellowship, that required me to write something, but <laughs> I, that's why in the next summer, the following summer, I began to work on, and uh, to write a first draft, uh, because I have I would have to report, on my progress. Uh, that's how it started. Uh, in a way, it was under pressure. Uh, but once it, it, I had the first draft, it was clear this would be a novel, a, a sizable novel. And <coughs> but but uh, of course, it, it took forever, several years, uh, many, many drafts uh, to, to reach the final stage. And also, in addition to that, the book w was very different from uh, whatever I had written before, because the setting, uh, even the techniques are different now. Um, <coughs> for instance, in uh, a book like Waiting, when I work on that book, basically I, I occupy the kind of privileged position, or space, I would say, in which the reader would not know of the, know of the references. Basically, whatever I say, it would be okay. Actual references won't be available. So my job, my task as a writer would be how to not to abuse my privilege, how to really to be authentic uh, and, uh, and res be responsible at the same time. So in that case, translatability is really a principle. That means if the book one day was translated back into Chinese and the people described in the book read it and they would believe this was true. I think that was a principle. For many years, it was a principle for me. But in case of this book, it was different because there are so many actual references. There were real people. And for instance, a lot of details, they have to be very factual because uh, all the readers <laughs> know <laughs> if, if uh, one read, uh, the details are wrong and the book itself will unravel itself. So that's why uh, uh, it was a different kind of a, a, a book. And uh, even technically, a lot of things are not are very different from before. For instance, in a book like, like Waiting or, or, or The Craze, whatever, all the novels set in China, nobody speaks English in, that, in those books. So that means that all the dialogue, all the dialogues are artificial. I created them, and so my job was to how to make them different from each other, how to make them sound convincing. But the whole thing, the whole a whole book is based on artifice. But once a novel is set in the states, especially about the immigrant experience, that technique is doesn't work anymore because there will be different kind of uh, speakers native speakers and different kind of immigrants using different Englishes so how can I make the difference make and uh, don't uh, make them distinct make all the characters distinct from each other um, so the that just that small one part of the technique is really it's a big challenge a very big challenge uh, as a result, I really have to abandon a lot, lot of uh, things I invented for myself. I mean, technical things I had invented for myself. They were not useful anymore. So uh, that's why this book really took a lot, a lot of uh, out of me. I really have, have to work very hard how to think, uh, uh, how to make the things, the whole story work. I think I said something like, uh, at any stage, a book like this could have failed me. I, I really meant that because 
there was so much uncertainty involved. And uh, this was a new territory for me. Everything was new. and um, But I was prepared for that, I think. Uh, if it, w it really didn't work, um, that I tried, I would try to do something else. <laughs> and fortunately, I think I managed to pull it through. Uh, I don't know how well it works, but but anyway, I pull it through. That's all I can say about it. <laughs> and a lot of people, I think, ask me in to what degree this book is uh, autobiographical. And that's another thing, I think, related to uh, techniques here. Um, I would say, there are two kinds, uh, at the micro level, it is, it had some autobiographical elements, but the big story is not mine. For example, I never dropped out of uh, graduate school, I never lived in New York, I never owned a restaurant, never worked in a Chinese restaurant, in fact, and I never returned to China. So all these major events in the protagonist's life are different from my life. Uh, the big story is not mine. That was really, I was determined to write a story that it is not mine. I do feel that as an immigrant, the, the pr protagonist really embodies a lot of people. Not I'm, my life, uh, for my life, um, I'm much more fortunate. I'm really am more lucky than, than, than Nan Wu here. For instance, there's a character in his friend, uh, a poet, teaching at Emory, Dick Harrison. In fact, I had his Harrison, Dick Harrison's job for many years, for nine years. Uh, <laughs> so that, in that sense, I, I'm much fortunate than the protagonist. But at the micro level, I had to give a lot of details, uh, personal details, uh, things and incidents I, what I surely knew about in order to make the, uh, the story convincing. Uh, f for instance, in American, in the U.S., in a U.S. elementary school, for in the first two years, there would there is only one teacher for one class. We call a room teacher, right? But in other countries, you would have teachers teaching different subjects: music, art, and but in addition, you have a room room teacher. In, that's why I had to be very careful about these details, and I have to know for sure, and that I can't say a, a pupil, a student, you know, first grader, and took classes from <laughs> different teachers in uh, uh, in the morning. That that's wrong detail. And so things like that, I had to be very certain. Uh, another example, f for instance, in Georgia. In Georgia, uh, you don't come across yard sales or, or garage sales because the church, the church is a huge power. Most people would donate whatever they don't need um, to Goodwill stores. So that's different from New England. And so all these kind of things, they are factual. They are there, actual references. I had to be very careful about them. That's why I, I chose to stay closer to my life at the micro level. I think in addition to that, there is actual, in fact, is a, there is a, a technical uh, solution here because I have al I'll be always teaching. When you, you have another job, it's very difficult to hold a, a entire novel in your mind. But no, ma no matter what, you have, when you reach the stage, the, the sooner the better, you have to hold the whole thing in your mind. That's why I think people cherish a novel. Novel is big because it indicates the capacity of your mind, how much the mind can hold. Um, so I think uh, as a writer, novelist, the, the sooner you reach that stage, the better, so that you can develop a kind of intimacy with the story. If one sentence changes, or you revise one sentence, the other parts will echo it. You have to adjust different parts in order to make the whole thing work. You have, in other words, everything you have to know everything very intimately. So for me, an easier way was to, to really to give a lot of details I, I was very familiar with so that I can really develop kind of intimacy with the story because it was sizable. I, 
I had to be able to hold the whole thing. <laughs> That's another reason. Uh, um, but in addition to that, I think I thought about this for a long time, how to write this, uh, this story. Writers like, like Conrad and Nabokov, I do feel some kind of affiliation, but they are different. For instance, Conrad, he would not acknowledge, uh, acknowledge any connection with the English literary tradition. And that's one of the reasons why he turned down um, offers of doctoral degrees given by Oxford and Cambridge, even a knighthood by the British government. He turned them down. And one of the reasons he said clearly he, he doesn't feel uh, he's part of that tradition. But ironically, later, of course, he's a major figure in that tradition. And that also means that he doesn't feel any connection with writers like Charles Dickens or Defoe. And, and Nabokov in a similar situation. I think they all wanted to be original. They really want to be original to, uh, to be a monument. Um, Conrad even, uh, Nabokov even bragged that some American, most American writers did not exist to him. He even said that. But for me, I think I, I'm, I was different. I th I'm, uh, I'm not an exile, exactly. I'm an immigrant. So there is a huge, huge tradition in American literature, the immigrant literature, tra literary tradition. That's why for me it's important for this book to echo, to respond to that tradition. In that sense, I really, uh, I have to look for a different body of literature in order to really to find the source and nourishment. For instance, in Waiting, there was a European book in many ways because in, in Anna Karenina, Madame Bovary, uh, Fathers and Sons were behind that book. But for this book, it's different. So I, I really, I used many, several American books and uh, try to gather strength and also inspiration uh, from them. Um, of course, one of them is my Antonia. Uh, for me, that book is very, very important. In a way, uh, really, it, it, that book touched upon a major theme, that is the, the land. The land itself is a character in that book. In fact, not just that book, all my pioneers also, the land in, that, in, the, in both novels is a character. Uh, as long as a person stays on the land, the person will be fine, will be abundant. Uh, and I think that's a part of uh, the origin of uh, the immigrant literature uh, that was, was very clear. Somehow that tradition is lost. And uh, nowadays people don't write about the land as a part of a new experience anymore. But I was, de I was determined to bring that uh, into this book. For me, it was not just uh, literary experience. When I arrived uh, at the state, at the United States in 1985, the first of my first impression was the land was different, very different from the land in China. And in fact, I wrote a letter, uh, the first letter to a, fr a best friend of mine. Uh, and I said, you know, our old land, our native land must be exhausted overused uh, I, because I realized that uh, nature was extraordinarily generous to America. It was very different from uh, Chinese landscape. So I was determined to, uh, to carry on that tradition. That's why there were so many descriptions of land in this book and that was intended and uh, really try to blend land and people together. And there's another book in American uh, literary tradition uh, by Nabokov, Punin, that is a big influence as well. Uh, I think people tend to treat that book as a book uh, on the exile experience. But Punin is also an immigrant because you know, he tried to look for a home, tried to buy a house, he couldn't and really can't, cannot settle down in the, in, in the United States because of the, um, the political or social environment and also language, linguistic uh, problem uh, is a big theme in that, in that book. Uh, for immigrants, I think language is a major subject. Uh, a lot of books 
about that experience have been written by people whose language is first, English is the first language. So, but there are, we tend to forget there are a lot of immigrants who don't speak English, or who try to learn English, but never can learn enough. And so the change of the, the, of the living condition, uh, or the reference frame, basically was very often defined by language. And language causes uh, isolation, and even damage, psychological damage as well. In that book, Punin, uh, uh, obviously, when Punin, he speaks Russian, and he's a different man. He, he sometimes he can be athletic, knowledgeable, extremely scholarly, very lovely man. But in English, he appears like an idiot. And some people uh, say uh, in that novel, he, wasn't, he shouldn't be allowed to to loiter within the vicinity of any American college because he really he was not capable because his language once his language reached the stage where he can say uh, okie dokie marginal utility after that no matter how hard he worked <laughs> it did not go <laughs> grow anymore so that was very common uh, in the immigrant experience so how to deal how to uh, tackle the prob the subject of language. That's another uh, important theme for for this book. In addition to that, also Nabokov developed a style. For me, that book is very important. Uh, Punin is very important. I think for many immigrants, non-native speaking immigrants, I think uh, very important uh, to know the style. Um, that book, I think, verbally is more. Adventurous than Lolita. There, there are moments, for instance, that when the narrator said, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, and then he said, on the third hand, this mental states can develop the volumes endlessly. See, that there is kind of a deliver, the deliberate playfulness based upon distortion. And as if the narrator is. A, like a child, amazed by the most common English features, uh, the most common features in the English language, and try to really try to play with it. Um, another, ex another example, Puning was uh, interviewed by he, his landlady. He was supposed to give a, 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 a talk about his background. So he gave a, a vita uh, in a in a nutshell, then the narrator said a coconut shell because the vita is too big, huge, <laughs> out of proportion. And um, Puning once serves, uh, g gives a party, he serves some uh, cocktail drinks. And, he's, and then he said, because the, the drink is strong, he would say a flamingo tail. So that kind of playfulness is based upon uh, distortion also misuse. He misused the language a lot. But a lot of mistakes really also indicates kind of creativity. So th for me, that is very precious, stylistically. It, really, it is because it's a new space. It's a space non-native speakers are more sensitive to. Because the th a non-native speaker migrates to English very often it's almost like a child is growing <laughs> in the language. So you still have some kind of innocence. It's important to, to carry on that innocence and to observe, uh, to be sensitive to the most common features and then develop a style. That's why I th this book, I <coughs> play with that kind of uh, misusage and distortion. Uh, let me give you an example, for instance. Ping Ping and uh, their son and uh, Toto, they tried to learn English together. The, the son just arrived, and then the mother tried to teach him uh, how to read. Uh, but the mother doesn't know enough English at all, but he kept, she, kept, she keeps reading to him. And then one day they come across to uh, the phrase, uh, lay waste, um, because they, they, are, they have been reading King Williams. And the boy said, what does that mean? What is lay waste? 
and the mother said, poop and pee everywhere. <laughs> so it's <laughs> so based upon the surface of the phrase, on the, uh, uh, the surface of the meaning. Uh, so there are things like that. <coughs> I think for me that is uh, a, a, to make this style, uh, to carry on that style, that kind of playfulness. But there is a kind of disadvantage for that. That also means this is not translatable anymore. Uh, as I mentioned before, I used to believe translatability is a literary principle. Uh, but now, once you create a style based upon uh, wordplay, and then the style is does not translate anymore. So that's the price one has to pay, I think. Uh, for me, I think I, I'm willing to pay. I think I, I should because, I, as I said, I'm not an exile exactly. I'm a more uh, immigrant, and so uh, that is really a departure, uh, a huge departure stylistically. In and um, that at the technical level, technical level, so there were a lot of things. How to make a major problem is how to make for me was how to make all the characters distinguishable. Uh, in their species, because there were um, s many characters speak Chinese, while there are na there are native speakers. <coughs> so how can I present the two languages, even other kinds of language? So I learned this from Call the Sleep. That is a book of languages, a classic, really a classic uh, 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 of the uh, about the immigrant experience. At the same time, it's really technically, it, it really provides a, a kind of a map for how to present all the languages. In, in that book, uh, the most elegant and lucid, beautiful language is Yiddish, but it, it is uh, presented in English. That's the really uh, elegant, beautiful English. And uh, English, in fact, is spoken, uh, is the ugly language, in, uh, but full of vitality because it is used on the street. All the characters illiterate, and most the immigrants, the children, they w they use that language, very a kind of very rough street language. But in between, there are there I there are Hebrew and there are other kind of English. The doctor would speak a more uh, elevated kind of language. So that really provides a, a map for me, technically, also thematically. That book is <coughs> is uh, very important for me as well because that book is about fear, a boy's fear, uh, a boy, a, a new immigrant landed in Manhattan and Brooklyn, and how he was frightened. Um, but I do believe for a lot of immigrants, fear is not just confined to children, but also adults. A lot of adults, like, fear is a major emotion uh, among immigrants. So that's why I, I want to stretch that a little bit, a little bit. Uh, also, there is another novel. I read it long ago, uh, also by, uh, about the Jewish Jewish uh, immigrant experience. Uh, by, uh, it was written by Abraham Kehan, um, The Rise of David Levinsky. It's a, it's a, it was, it's an older and long novel. Toward the end of the novel, the man, the Russian Jew, became a a very important business uh, businessman in the garment industry in in New York, uh, but he felt empty. He really he felt lost. Uh, he still had fear for waiters because of when he was poor, people treated him badly, and he felt the money really didn't make him any better. Uh, the, in other words, the American dream was lost. So for me, that was important. That's one stage for the immigrant experience. There are other stages. That's why this book, I want this book to go a little bit further uh, and see, uh, let the protagonist realize his American <laughs> dream sooner and see what will happen. So you know, uh, in short, and this book in many ways really echo the American immigrant experience, uh, immigrant literature. But at the same time, I was aware of the fact that immigration, uh, Im immigration uh, as, a, as a theme is a very minor literary theme. Is uh, there are not many great 
literary, I mean, uh, classics written on this experience. It is primarily American. In contrast, the, the exile is really the big theme. We went from the very beginning, you know, Odyssey, Divine Comedy, you name it, all the, you know, that is the real literature. So for me, it was, uh, th there was a challenge here, that is how to really, not just about, uh, not just confine the book to the immigrant experience, how to make the echo to other literary traditions as well. So that's why this book can also be read as a love story, or a story about the life and the art. And other themes such as language and, and the individual versus versus uh, the state. That's another theme here. So, I because I I wanted to branch out based upon the big subject, big subject of the American immigrant experience, and at the same time, and echo. It echoes other literary traditions. Mm -hmm. That's how the basic idea, uh, you know, uh, the conception uh, of the <laughs> of this book of course I didn't plan everything in the beginning and only after many drafts gradually I figure out I figure out what I need and try to look and read and uh, and really get uh, 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 whatever I could uh, from different authors and originally I planned that the novel would end with uh, uh, some extracts from uh, uh, Nan Wu's li uh, poetry journal. I thought this would be fine because nobody ever used a, a poetry journal <laughs> as an epilogue. This should be okay. But as I, after a few drafts, uh, I realized this would not work because without showing that he is talented and his talent uh, had been, has been stunted by the, the immigration immigrant experience uh, process. Without doing that, and he would, uh, he would appear like a crackpot, and really, and, and he, he j he's just a crazy man, mad man. And so that's why I had to add some poems uh, in addition to the uh, uh, extracts uh, from his journal. But uh, there is a huge di uh, disadvantage for that. The disadvantage is by doing that, people would associate this novel to Dr. Zhivago structurally. In fact, uh, several reviewers already mentioned it was very easy for people to, to really do, to, to, pick <laughs> to pick up the connection. But uh, for me, I was in a way cornered. I didn't, there was no way to cut corners here. And uh, I had to do an uh, honest job. Uh, so that's why I spent uh, many, many months working on the poems. I had published some of the poems on my own, but they were not included, in the, uh, like three or four. And then I wrote the, the rest, 20-some uh, poems, uh, in response to, to the story. And that's how you know, the, the book uh, <laughs> came into e existence. Uh, let me just read one poem. Uh, and so, uh, uh, to show you uh, some kind of a thematic concern here. This is called Homeland. You pack the pouch of earth into your baggage as a bit of your homeland. You told your friend, in a few years I'll be back like a lion. There's no other place I can call home. And wherever I go, I carry our country with me. I will make sure my children speak our language, remember our history, and follow our customs. Rest assured, you will see this same man made of loyalty, bringing back gifts and knowledge from other lands. You won't be, op you won't be able to go back. Look, the door has closed behind you. Like others, you too are expendable to a country never short of citizens. You will toss in sleepless nights, confused, homesick, and weeping in silence. Indeed, loyalty is a ruse if only one side intends to be loyal. You will have no choice but to join the refugees and change your passport. Eventually, you will learn 
Your country is where you raise your children, and your homeland is where you build your home. And I think the idea uh, homeland, I think that's quite unique in, in the English language. In other languages, I think people would use fatherland or motherland. Basically, that those words indicate the land of origin. But in English, the word homeland has two meanings. The first meaning is land of origin, you know, where you are from. But the second meaning is the land where your home is. So there is a dichotomy in the word. And conventionally, it was very easy to reconcile the two. And very often, we use homeland uh, for the first meaning to refer to one's origin. But nowadays, gradually, I think the second meaning, the place where your home is, has been taking over. Uh, I think it dominates the word uh, homeland now. Uh, for instance, nowadays, we, we, can, we often hear people say, my new homeland, my second homeland, my adopted homeland, right? And these phrases indicate homeland is not something um, you, in the past, it's something that can be obtained or can arrive. You can go get to, I think, somewhere you can get to. It indicates arrival rather than return. And so I think that is uh, uh, really, uh, I think it's, uh, that word in English is much richer uh, than and the word fatherland or motherland. Uh, really, it's um, uh, signifies arrival, and that is uh, for I think in that sense, immigrant uh, homeland for the immigrants means more like uh, arrival than one's departure, <laughs> the place where you departed from, and so that's why the poem, in fact, uh, try to try to cope with that uh, sense. Okay, uh, I think I, I have spoken enough. I hope you have questions. <laughs> I'm going to pop up because we are taping this. So um, if you'd raise your hands, I'm going to repeat the question, and then Professor Jin will answer. Yes. Um, in your speech, you mentioned uh, Nabokov and Joseph Conrad. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it seems that mm -hmm. like you have brought the richness of the immigrant literature to your own work. I am very Thank happy you. that this book comes um, comes to us and I will be lucky to read it. I have a question. Um, growing up in China, basically you grew up in China, right? Yeah. With the um, your abundant um, experience, including uh, cultural revolution, um, you, your, all your books must have a very solid support of your, of your writing. Yes. Uh, I, my question is this. From China, bring in the Chinese literature, which is also amazingly beautiful, yes. serene and beautiful. Um, do you think it is possible to bring that to integrate into your book, uh, and how? Sure, I, I think, I think, I think it's possible in the way that uh, Chinese, the language and the literature somehow is always a part of the, my, my writing. Because you know, I grew up with Chinese poetry and that really shaped my sensibility in many ways. That cannot be, it's a part of myself. Uh, there's no way for me to not to use that. Also, Chinese literature has a great tradition in, in poetry. It's a grand tradition, uh, very rich, uh, endless resources. And I think that's entirely possible. But I think there is a distinction here. For instance, writers like, there is a famous, there was a famous Chinese writer, Lin Yutang, uh, Yutang Lin, um, who was immensely popular uh, around mid-century, uh, in the 50s and 60s. And he viewed himself as an ambassador of Chinese culture. He wrote a lot of books, and basically he tried to introduce China to the, to the Western audience. And he also he was also a novelist. And I think I admire that, 
but I think I view myself differently as a writer. For me, I think a writer is not just a broker of a culture, but also a creator of a culture, a maker of a culture. A great novel must be part of a culture. So at the very beginning, one should envision what kind of culture order a book will enter into. For me, that's, that's more important. Um, <coughs> So I, in that sense, I do use, I do try to make the best use of Chinese language and the literary tradition. But at the same time, I try to avoid being an ambassador. It is a huge task. Also, I think I would just sell whatever our ancestors made for me. I would prefer to make something new. I think, in a, in a way, I think this is related to the immigrant experience. For instance, fortune cookie. This book also mentioned that the boy never saw a fortune cookie <laughs> when he arrived at the United States. Because for the Chinese, this was American product. Really, nowadays, in China, people say this genuine American product, fortune cookies. But what he, that was created. It's a part of a cooking, uh, part of a culture created by American Chinese here. So I think that's the example. One is supposed to create new things, not to just use old things. Old things, not just sell old things, but use old things to create new things. I think that's the b basic principle. Okay, next question. Yes? Have your works translated into Chinese or did it? Uh, yes, oh, no, yes. In fact, they were, uh, all the fiction books uh, have been translated uh, into Chinese, but uh, by, by published by a Taiwanese publisher. So the books are available in Taiwan and the, the Chinese diaspora. But in mainland China, Waiting was published briefly and then it went out of print. And other books are basically are banned. And I have a five, uh, five book contracts with, with a publisher, a Shanghai publisher. And they sent under the red under the red flag as the first one to try the censorship department, uh, but that book was shut down. So they basically they abandoned the whole project. They wouldn't continue anymore. So that's the situation. Uh, there are I think there are some pirate editions. Uh, yeah. I occasionally I write, for instance, uh, I would write essays in Chinese, but I don't think I could afford to write a long creative work in Chinese anymore. Because, see, English itself is already a big struggle for me. And just to survive in another language, that is really a huge task, a huge challenge. I have to learn to concentrate. That's why I cannot be an ambassador at all. <laughs> By being an ambassador, you, that means you don't just speak to the Western audience. At the same time, you sell Western <laughs> things to the Chinese audience. But for me, that's, that's too much for me. Uh, and I have to concentrate uh, on one language. I, I do believe basically an author exists in one language. That it doesn't mean that other literatures cannot accept their author. For instance, Conrad has been accepted as a Polish writer, although he did not write in Polish. Uh, and so that, so for me, that really, I have to learn how to survive. Basically, it's a matter of survival. It's very hard and to, to really to, just imagine if you write fiction in Chinese, that also means you have to really keep in touch with the current idiom, right? That's why a lot of uh, Chinese emigrants would go back to China to get recharged. That's the word they use, like batteries, <laughs> to get recharged, to, to be familiar with, with the idiom so that they can, <coughs> they can write. And there, there will be endless troubles, such as you will never know what kind of work final product would be. Any editor can really can cut, can reshape your story. If you really want to publish a book in China, it's very hard. I think not just, I, I know some writers, it's very hard. They, they would send to China, a publisher in China, a, a really very good, excellent manuscript, but the, 
either the manuscript is rejected or required, uh, must be revised in order to meet, meet some kind of standard. That is a very painful experience, a lot of frustration. So that's why I think I, I, I would prefer to stay in English. But doesn't mean I don't write in Chinese. I do. But the major work should be done in English. Question. Yes, um, you mentioned some of the immigrant mixed out writers that you've read before and while writing this book. Mm -hmm. Who are the writers who influenced your earlier books? Oh, each depends on depend on on, <laughs> uh, on the the nature of the book. For instance, I, I mentioned waiting really the Euro the European love novels Anna Karenina, Madame Bovary, Fathers and Sons. They were a major influence behind behind that book. For for instance, my first book, Ocean of Words, uh, Isaac Bible, and and Chekhov, uh, were big influence. Bible served in in the Red Army, so my stories were about the experience in the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army. That's why I try to learn from uh, from Bible. Another question? Yes, over there. When, when you're writing dialogue, are you thinking in Chinese? Or are you thinking in English? Or does it depend on the character? See that's the, in this book is different because there are uh, there are native speakers, so I have to hear them speak, and there are non-natives, uh, there are immigrants who speak different kinds of English. So I really try to figure out, try to figure out what kind of language they would use. I really I have to think in in their language. But if a book set is set in China, it's different. Because nobody, no, no character speaks English. Basically, I, very often, in fact, I hear, I would hear Chinese idioms <laughs> they use. I, in other words, I could not suppress their voices at all. Right? Uh, uh, my job in that case would be try to adapt, try to invent a different kind of uh, diction for each character. But everything was art artificial. Quite more artificial. This is artificial as well. You know, authenticity is an illusion uh, in writing. Uh, but the, that is, m in if a book set in China, everything is much more artificial, and all the speeches basically are given by me myself as the author. Nobody speaks English, so that that is the difference. Next question, yes. Um, you've been translated into Chinese in Taiwan. Yeah. You, so have they translated all of your books? Fiction books. Yes, Fiction books. books yes. And uh, are they widely circulated? How Wouldn't they get to China via Taiwan, even though it might be clandestine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are some sp uh, copies uh, smuggled back into China, sure. Yeah, there there are some yes, and uh, as I said, there are some pirate editions as well. Uh, but I th I think there are, there is a difference in between a book like like the Crazed and Wall Trash, and, and the other kind would be Waiting. Waiting is a mild book to the Chinese authorities, but the Crazed is different because it touched upon the the Tiananmen massacre. And the war trash also the subject is uh, the Korean War. That is a, a taboo subject as well. So even even in, you know people even the pirate the pirates. I mean they would not reprint this kind of books because politically they are too sensitive. They would do like a selected stories. <laughs> they added the stories, <laughs> apparently, and also waiting. They would do that kind of books, but not the politically really, uh, politically sensitive books. Yes. Have a nice question. Yes, go ahead. So, uh, the title of uh, Free Life, mm -hmm. you, you refer to as free as what? I mean, you know, when, you know, I'm an immigrant too. I come from Thailand. So when you first come here, you know, um, Actually, you're, it's not so free that no, no. you cannot do anything. You know, you, I mean, not do anything. I mean, you, 
you cannot master the language. I mean, it's pretty restricted to certain areas. So, I mean, so, um, basically, there's a lot of things you can do. Sure, sure. That's why. That's why. That's what the free. A free life doesn't mean a life is free. That's different. You see, the, a free life here means I think, especially when we talk about the immigrant experience, there is a, a huge price to pay for freedom. It's the very obvious one would be uncertainty and the risk, and frustration. And but I think the book, in a way, is a eulogy for those who are willing to pay the price with knowledge and uh, determination to, to pay the price for it. I think freedom is not uh, just uh, something handed over to somebody. It's a state of mind. I think even if uh, people are capable financially or socially of being free, but that doesn't mean you can use freedom. For a lot of immigrants, I think we don't know, we didn't know how to use freedom for many years. It's a, a kind of a mental state we have to develop gradually to adjust to, to the idea, to take uncertainty as part of the process, part and also personal loss, sacrifice, as part of the prize. And of course, a lot of people would prefer security to freedom. That's very clear. That's very clear. For instance, in, in a recent poll uh, about the people's trust in governments around the world, China came up number one, highest. The obvious people prefer security, not freedom. That's very obvious. And then if you give freedom, just the immediately you give them freedom, I don't think people can use it, right? It's a really a, mind, a, a mindset. It, it's, a, it's really, it, there are so many things involved in that idea. Yes. Um, your discussion so far seems to have centered on, like, about the same book, seems to center on the immigrant experience mm -hmm. in general versus, like, the uh, specific Chinese immigrant yeah. experience. So I was wondering if you could speak about whether you feel like there is, like, a bigger similarity of a general immigrant experience versus, like, the difference um, resulting from their original culture, mm -hmm. like the Russian Jew. Um, sure. Sure. In fact, I... I I mentioned that there are some immigrants, for instance, Indian immigrants. Basically, English is their first language. That's a huge difference, a huge difference. And also, I think for the Chinese immigrants, and there is a stu still a strong sense of uh, the community and the individual, the struggle between the two, the tension. Uh, that is also partly uh, one of the minor themes here in this book. That's very obvious because uh, the protagonist at some point they try to stay away from the Chinese community in the land, uh, but somehow the old country and the community always manage to catch up with them. Uh, th that's very clear. And also, I think we can talk, we really, we can expand this endlessly. With, if we take uh, race or color into the, the uh, into the discussion, then. You know, an immigrant from Europe would be very different from a, a Chinese immigrant, right? For instance, it's very much easier for a European immigrant to be treated as an American than <laughs> an Asian, a Chinese immigrant. So there, there are all kinds of differences. And, and but above all, I think for, the, for the ch many Chinese uh, immigrants, uh, the struggle between the individual and the community and the younger generation, the older generation, are more severe than other, perhaps than the other groups. Mm -hmm. One last question. Don't be shy. Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. You. Thank you.